Thank you both for joining us. We, um, we're gonna get started even though a pause is not here yet, but I'm sure he'll join us in a minute. I'm gonna pass it on to Greg. Uh, you'll be leading this, this panel, Greg. Thanks for doing that. Um, and then I believe that Steve is joining us from overseas, which is awesome. So I'm glad that we have you here and Amy from the Bay Area. Welcome you guys. Okay, uh, onto you Greg and I'm disappearing. Hi, I'm Dr. Greg Charlotte, and thank you for joining our panel on stress and stress management. And we've got an incredible group of folks here. And before we get into the questions, I'd like you each to introduce yourselves. Uh, hopefully Pauls will come in and we'll give him a chance to do that as well. But why don't you guys introduce yourselves, spend a minute, tell us who you are and what you're all about. Do you wanna start, Steve? Sure, absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Steve Grave uh, from My Endurance, uh, a practice that I have. I'm a counseling psychologist that specializes in working with athletes and other performers, such as musicians, executives, entrepreneurs, on better managing stress and enhancing the mental aspect of performance. And I'm founder of uh, My Endurance, my own private practice, where I do some individual coaching and consulting and counseling, as well as some presentations and such. So happy to be here to chat about stress and athletics athletics and well-being. Amy? Yep. Hi, I'm Amy Saltzman, and I am a holistic physician and a mindfulness coach. And my profile is actually pretty similar to yours. So uh, supporting athletes, executives, performers in uh addressing stress and finding joy and flow in sports and life. And uh, I'm at stillquietplace.com and I have a book called Still Quiet Place for Athletes, which is really applicable to anybody in the high performance realm. Great, great, glad to have you here. And I'm Dr. Greg Charlotte. I'm a sports performance expert. I work with athletes and teams and startups who are looking to optimize performance. And I'm the author of the book, Why Doctors Skip Breakfast. You can get Why Doctors Skip Breakfast online from Amazon if you're interested in that. And presently we're working on a big project to help women athletes and historically disadvantaged athletes, a big media project. So for people who are interested in that, I'd love to chat with you. And that's kind of one of our big directions. And today we're talking about stress. So I'm I'm thrilled to do that. It looks like Paul's just came on. So let's see, is that you, Paul's? Hello, hello, good morning, everyone. Hi, good morning. Can you take a minute and tell us about yourself? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I joined in the wrong Zoom, so I was listening, but I wasn't able to join in. <laughs> absolutely. So my name is Paul Spigatz. I'm Olympic pole vaulter, trio point therapy specialist, mindful yoga instructor, and strength and conditioning coach, as well as have my own company, uh, pujas.org, which is all about health and wellness. So directly correlated to what we're going to talk about today. And of course, right. I'm also athlete success coach for Obsesh, which helps athletes after and during their athletic career uh, to develop their brand and to give bookings, you know, to their fans and followers using their following. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're glad you're all here and we'll just jump right into it. So I want to start with the first question, which is, you know, we always hear about stress. I mean, I remember I'm old enough. I've heard about stress since I was little. It was always like one of the worst things in the world. But I'm curious, how big of a deal really is stress? And is there good stress and bad stress or is all stress bad? Amy, why don't you start this one off and, and tell us, is all stress bad and what, what's the scoop on it? Well, it's interesting because when I saw the question in the preliminary emails, um, I'm hesitant actually to categorize stress as good or bad. And so I want to talk about it in terms of flow. So one of the nine scientific components of flow is that when we have a challenge and we feel that we have the skills to meet those challenges, that's the place where we can experience flow. If we aren't challenged enough, we're bored. And if we're challenged too much, we may feel anxious. But I actually think that when we frame the conversation in terms of good stress and bad stress, 
then we can make people feel anxious about feeling anxious, which isn't super helpful. And what we really want to do is help them acknowledge their stress or distress and make make compassionate space for it so that it's not affecting adversely affecting their performance. And Amy, I appreciate that point. You know, when we, when we, you're right, you know, when you attach labels like good and bad, then people are like, oh my God, do I have the bad? Do I have the good? You know, is, is this a problem? So I, 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 I like what you're saying that we shouldn't really label things kind of in a judgmental way like that. Um, certainly there is this concept called toxic stress that could be for really terrible things like say physical danger, or divorce, things like that. I'm curious, Steve, how do you approach people in terms of rating stress? And do you tell people that certain types of stress are helpful or not helpful? And what is your approach to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, would, I would echo a lot of what Amy's saying is that at the end of the day, a, a lot of it is our interpretation of the stress. So one person's good stress might be someone else's bad stress. And though physiologically anticipating one of your band, favorite bands to, to take stage um, for a concert, you're going to be experiencing, you know, be hyped up. Uh, but in other cases, going and giving a public talk, you're not super comfortable about, and you're experiencing a very similar physiological thing, but your interpretation of that in the moment is going to be important. So I think it's it's critical for individuals to understand what is the relationship that they have with the situation that's unfolding in front of them. Why are some situations, situations that are more comfortable or positive for them, whereas these other situations are one that seem more negatively triggering. And so by unraveling kind of what they fear or what they feel is at stake in those situations differently, it helps them to further understand what the relationship is with that stress and anxiety, and then allows them to uncover the most appropriate tools to be able to manage them effectively. Now, Pauls, you are a successful athlete. You know, you reach that, that the elite levels of, of sports. And I'm sure even just from your own personal experience, you got to see how stress affected your body generally. And then also secondarily, how stress affected your athletic performance. So I'm curious, can you, can you shed some light on how stress affects the body and then in, in particular, how it affects your, your performance in sport? Absolutely. So I'm going to go to the basics. So first off, how does muscle grow? You know, it's, it grows only under stress. <laughs> so in a small stress, when you emit it, you slowly build up and that's how you become stronger. The same thing happens in your mind with your brain. With small stress, it's healthy. You know, it is absolutely good and necessary for it. Similarly to when you go to the diets to like intermittent fasting, you know, that survival mechanism switches on and allows you to survive because, you know, it's, it's on, on, on small stress. It's not, there's no food coming in and it's good. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be over consuming anything. So in moderation, everything is in moderation, you know, from your workouts, from your sleep, from your food and in work, especially work, because I think this is so, it's such a, um, important topic that I don't think many people, uh, I guess, talk about, especially when COVID hit, the stress is so much higher than, than ever before. People are admitting, and they're not able to, to cope with it. Um, and this is coming from straight from my athletics, you know, a little bit of stress gradually, slowly building up is, is really good. It's healthy, but you need to know, understanding your own capacity, how much you can tolerate and how much is too much. That's why it's good when you have a coach or you have a mentor, you have someone who can guide you and help you. Um, so yeah, this is, this is something that I've, I've experienced before as well because athletes might, and in general, I feel like people, they tend to over, overly do things and then they need to suffer or then they need to re, -co re cooperate. And it's just, it's just something that they don't understand or they don't feel it. And they just go because someone has told them to do it or someone, you know, they, they feel like they have the, all these responsibilities, which are just made up things in their own minds. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of how, how, uh, how I view stress uh, in terms of not a good thing, not a bad thing. It's just, it needs to be there at certain times and periods. <laughs> you know, I'm so happy you mentioned that. And I, I really agree with you actually, particularly about how a mild amount of stress 
is is good and there's growing evidence for this you know and in some ways we almost live too pampered a life and and that's <laughs> that's why we think that if you fast if you do intermittent fasting it's good for you when you lift weights you're like you said you're stressing your muscles some people are even starting to think if you put yourself in cold places and you, you suffer just a little bit that kind of stress is is good it helps you grow and it might help you live longer i'm Absolutely. certainly a big advocate of intermittent fasting yeah, I'm, I'm curious, it, Dr. Amy. Evidence behind of it too. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, there's just so much evidence behind it as well. Like so many studies already shown. You know, uh, you should not be afraid of like putting yourself out in a little bit of stress, but not overly, overly. You know, putting an environment where you stress all the time because overly stressed out situation is very toxic. Like uh, Steve, Steve mentioned this one as well. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna poison you up and then not gonna be able to uh, you know do anything without it. It's 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 gonna put you down only. Yeah, I'm curious about that, Dr. Amy. What what effects, if any, have you seen on athletic performance by people that were suffering from too much stress or that had difficulty coping with stress? Yeah, well, I think both fortunately and unfortunately, we've had some really prominent examples recently, um, Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka. And so I kind of want to correct something that I said before. I think that it's super important to acknowledge when you're stressed, to do what you can to take care of yourself. And I think later we're going to talk about practices for self-care and self-support but also to reach out to other people for support and to make sure that you're not kind of being stoic and going it alone, specifically when the stress is overwhelming. So I don't want to minimize the effects of to toxic stress. And I do want to encourage people to reach out and get support, preferably before it gets to that point. But certainly as soon as they notice that it gets to that point. And for me, that's where mindfulness comes in, in terms of being aware as early as possible that, oh, I'm having a rough time. I'm struggling. I need to either support myself in certain ways or reach out to someone else for support. Uh, Dr. Amy, I'm glad you mentioned this about reaching out for, for support when you feel overwhelmed with stress. What do you, for someone listening at home who feels that maybe they're one of those people, they have too much stress now, what should they do? Who should they speak to or where should they look for support? Well, I think you're, you've got a panel of really good resources right here. So we could start with that. Um, I have a book, someone else mentioned a book. And often if you're feeling toxic stress, that's not enough and you need a true ally. So someone on the panel, someone else speaking um, today in the sessions. Uh, you know, ideally it would be your coach or your trainer. Uh, in some situations, those are actually the people who are causing the stress. So it needs to be someone that you, that you really trust in your most vulnerable moment. And if you're not feeling vulnerable right now, you want to start building those relationships anyways, because um, you may feel vulnerable later and you do want some resources and maybe some resources. Sometimes I was a gymnast and uh, so the issues with the gymnast are really in my heart, but it's also probably important to have trusted resources outside the circle of your training uh, a little bit removed so that if there's a problem there, you have an independent resource. Now, Dr. Steve, we were just talking about the need of reaching out for help if you're feeling overwhelmed with stress. What if someone's listening and they don't know if they're really overwhelmed with stress or they're under too much stress? How, how could someone who's watching us today kind of get a handle on whether what they're feeling is normal or whether it's too much? How, how do you evaluate whether your own stress levels are too high? Well, first off, it's all normal, right? Because it speaks to the complicated aspect of the human experience. So sometimes we have severe suffering and sometimes we have a little bit of suffering and it's all on the continuum of how we navigate and experience life. But I think it's important to take a real pragmatic viewpoint of stress 
And in some ways, I think we as psychologists and, and counselors and, and folks have done a great service of building awareness around depression and anxiety and such. But sometimes that's the only thing that receives the spotlight is it's mental health disorder month. It's not really mental health awareness month. It's not mental health disorder month because they talk about disorders and look at this athlete who had this disorder in this really tough time. But the reality is, is we can benefit from talking to somebody at any point in our lives, because as we navigate through life, there are various obstacles and problems that we encounter. Sometimes we're able to uh, successfully navigate those obstacles on our own. And sometimes we need to chat it out with somebody else. It doesn't mean it needs to be this huge, magnificent, severe thing, but simply just chatting things out. And so if I think if there's a listener out there that's just finding themselves nervous about something or, or curious about something in their lives or something keeps coming up that they just can't seem to resolve in any type of way, get it out of your own head, put it out on a table like some puzzle pieces with a professional and then together, you're able to create an accurate picture of what might be going on. Uh, so, yeah, certainly if somebody can't get out of bed and they're seeing things or they're hearing things or they're starting to really feel struggle, go talk to somebody. But also if you're finding, you know what, I just there have some stuff I want to sort out. That's cool. Go make that happen. Sort it out with somebody who's objective that can help you put those puzzle pieces together. So it sounds like if I'm understanding you right, you're saying you shouldn't just wait until your back is against the wall to seek help. You should really go early um, and, and often probably to get advice. Absolutely. I'm going to take my car in for regular checkups. I'm not going to wait until the engine blows up because then it really becomes a problem. But going in for an oil change, even if you think it's a little early, the mechanic's probably going to give you a high five and be proud of you for doing that. And I think we as, as helping professionals should do the same thing and really encourage people get this stuff out of head and heart early before it's too late. Now, Paul, so I, I want to build on this theme, and you had mentioned before, you know, that some stress is good and, and it helps you grow, and now we've kind of touched on how some stress could be too much and it could cause you trouble. What have you done personally, or what do you recommend to people when they feel like they're feeling too much stress? Are there some techniques or certain things to do that can help make things better? Uh, great points from, from all three of you, honestly. Uh, putting the puzzle pieces together really, really nicely. I'm going to share a personal story. So, you know, in pole vaulting, there's a lot of mental aspect goes into it. You know, you got to have a, have a 17 football in your hands. You got to run full speed, plant it somewhere in the ground and lift yourself up <laughs> and then jump in the air. And hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, you land in the mat <laughs> and the pole doesn't break. <laughs> so putting all that aspect, it's kind of an extreme sport and mental, mental aspect. There is, I would say 95%, honestly, the physically, if you can, if you can walk, if you can run, you know, you can lift up your hands, you're good. You know, you can pull both mentally though. It is the most challenging event that I've ever, ever gone through. Um, so this aspect where I was training, you know, and then I have this goal, this vision that I want to achieve. Again, I put myself into the mindset, like I have to, you know, achieve this goal no matter what. And if something doesn't happen, you tend to like condemn yourself. It's like, oh my gosh, why is this happening right now? And if you get an injury for athlete injury, it's like, it's like sentence, that's it. Your career is over. You know, you never know which injury is going to be the one that's going to take you away. Because a lot of times uh, for, for athletes, they don't get to choose when they leave the sport. A lot of times the injury gets the decide, deciding factor when you're going to leave it. So here, um, the, the coaches, the trainers, the other athletes who are in the same field or similarly or have gone through this are amazing, amazing way how you can get that information out of, you know, out of them and then understand what's the right thing to do with the current situation. Because many people, many athletes particularly, are so confused, they don't know what to do. And they, a lot of times, um, go into these negative emotions in terms of like, um, whether there be depression, anger, sadness, you know, all these emotions, all the confusion comes to them and they don't understand how to deal with them. And that emotion, when they put it down on the injury or when they can't go over that mental hurdle is gonna hurt them even more and more. So they're literally just building up for more issues. So when I was pole vaulting and I was competing and trying to get qualified for, for Tokyo, um, I getting these injuries all the time and I was trying to, you know, get myself more riled up, more positive. 
And, you know, my coaches also were kind of pushing me towards that. So there's not only from myself, there was from other people as well. Like keep pushing and pushing. Also comes from the family. They still push you. <laughs> and not in the kind of good way. Sometimes they like, uh, I don't know how, how the people's support system was, but uh, mine was mine was pretty military and it was not the nicest one. <laughs> It was like basically talking yourself down in terms of like putting your someone up, which is just the completely opposite. You know, you should not be doing that. You should be encouraging someone, you know, to, to achieve something great. You and, know, Paul, I was, I was listening to your story about the Paul Paul yeah. thing. And while I was hearing you tell it, I was getting ready to hide under the table because I, I knew that that is not a situation I would want to be in at all. And, you know, of course, I work with athletes, but I'm not an athlete myself. And part of me thinks that athletes are probably in many ways just naturally better equipped to handle high levels of stress than perhaps the rest of us. I'm curious, Pauls, as an athlete and as someone who knows a lot of athletes, do you think that maybe athletes, number one, have a higher stress tolerance than other people? And number two, do you think maybe they almost give themselves too much credit that, yeah, I can handle this so I can handle anything and therefore they think that they're Superman or Superwoman and, and they can't be defeated by stress. Maybe they're overly confident in their ability to handle stress. Some do, and that confidence actually helps them a lot. Uh, I think it's important to understand clarity and confidence because confidence can be very dangerous. Clarity is way more better approach when you have clear vision, but it's like with anything in life. If you've done this for multiple years for over one, one day after another, hours and hours of work, you're gonna have that confidence. You gotta have that clarity. So that's that's where you build up that confidence as well, that clarity and that you know the tolerance of stress because they don't really experience it that much. They just like, get accustomed to it. It's like with anything, you know, going to cold showers. If you start slowly, like five seconds first, and later on after a week, ten seconds, then fifteen, you slowly build up to it. Anyone can do it. Like you know, athletes are just put into this event from early on, and then you just. Uh, surrounding with that kind of like small stress factors. So yeah, anyone can do it, anyone. Uh, Dr. Amy, you work with, with athletes and people dealing with a lot of stress. What, what techniques or advice do you give them to kind of work through the stress and, and to manage it better? And I know you wrote a book on a similar topic. So what are some of your tips for people in terms of improved stress management? Well, first, I want to pick up a thread from Steve about um, prevention. And then the other thing is, I really want to emphasize that, at least for me, with mindfulness, the data shows that the skills that help us deal with stress, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, risky behavior, are actually the same skills that help us find flow and joy. So you don't need to wait till you're feeling stressed to learn these skills and they can enhance your performance um, even if you're not feeling stressed. So learn them early. And you know, my primary skills that I teach athletes are mindfulness and self-compassion. And mindfulness is paying attention in the present moment with kindness and curiosity so that we can choose our behavior. And Self-compassion is kind of the antidote to what Paul says about the both the internal and the external negative chatter that so many of us are subject to. And if we can learn to meet ourselves in each moment with mindfulness and self-compassion, then we can choose how we deal with our anxious feelings if we're getting ready to compete how we have a conversation with our coach or our parents if things aren't going well, um, how we handle an injury. And so those are the primary skills that I teach. And then each athlete's individual and sometimes they need a little bit of something else or a little bit in addition, or they have to find the way to tweak it so that it's really theirs and that it works for them in the situations that they're in. So there are some fundamental skills and then the athletes can uh, modify those to be, to be the most beneficial to them. Now, I'd like to follow up on that because I love mindfulness and I, I love self-compassion. I, I wanna just expand on this a bit. Uh, 
what's the difference between self-compassion and self-pity, number one? And number two, are these skills, self-compassion and mindfulness, are they, are they things we could strengthen with practice? In other words, if, if we do them regularly, do we get better? Does it almost become reflexive if you, if you do it all the time? Yeah, so I'm going to take the last one first. Th to me, mindfulness and self-compassion are like any other athletic skill, you know, dribbling with your left foot and your right foot um, in soccer or shooting free throws and layups. And definitely the more you practice them, the more available they are, you know, in those heat of the moment clutch situations. And so, yes, practice is definitely helpful. The difference between self-compassion and self-pity is the kindness. Um, you know, self-compassion has three pieces, mindfulness, which is being aware that you're having a difficult moment, common humanity, which means understanding that everyone, all athletes, all coaches, all uh, therapists, all whoever's have moments of difficulty and treating yourself with kindness. And there are actually two kinds of self-compassion. One is tender self-compassion where sometimes what we really need is comforting and nurturing. And the other is fierce self-compassion. And sometimes what we really need is um, in a kind, supportive, but still energetic kind of forceful way to say, come on, get up. You can do it. You can do it again. You've got this, or we may need fierce self-compassion to set boundaries. Um, so I think it's the, the thing that distinguishes self-compassion and I'm working this through because it's not a question I've been asked before. So I'm working it through in real time, but um, is the kindness. And I think there's also an action piece, right? How do I best care for myself in this moment? And sometimes best care for myself is like take a nap or crawl into bed and binge watch some Netflix. And sometimes how I take care of myself is I do that one more set, even though, um, you know, my quad is tired or I don't really feel like it. And so it's distinguishing those. So that, that's my current answer. You can ask me again in a week and I probably will have a more eloquent response, but good enough for now. Now, Dr. Steve, I wanna give you a chance to jump in on this one. Um, your name is mentioned, so I wanna give you a chance to, to add context. And also, I, I know that you work with a lot of people. What are some of the techniques that you give to people when they feel that they're under a lot of stress to help manage their stress? Yeah, so something I use a lot with clients to, to make it a step-by-step, -step, and I, even for them, I call it C, uh, psychological first aid or psychological CPR. I call it the ABCs, where A stands for acknowledge, appreciate, and accept. And this speaks to kind of Amy and Paul's idea of mindfulness, that we're all going to experience things, but just acknowledging what's going on, perhaps why it might be going on, and just appreciating and accepting that it has a space in your existence as an athlete or a human being. Uh, but then kind of understanding and appreciating that that anxiety and that doubt or that depression could be messing up a dry eraser board and all of these thoughts and feelings and behaviors are just cluttering up this, this a dry eraser board. So B stands for breathing and breathing allows you to pause and you then essentially dry off that dry eraser board where now you have a clean slate where you can more deliberately choose what you want to think, feel, or do now. And what you choose to think, feel, or do now might be, I'm going to set a goal. I need to eat a banana. I need to have a difficult conversation with my coach. You know, whatever you need to choose, think, or feel, or do in that moment, um, that's going to vary depending on what particular obstacle is in front of you or what's triggering you in that particular way. So the ABCs I found to be very helpful when people are in a tough spot to just have a go-to. Is it the end-all be-all? Absolutely not, right? I have enough student loans that says I've learned a lot of different tricks and tips in my sleeve, but uh, ABC I think captures quite a bit of it for folks. Now, I want to stick with you, Dr. Steve, 
because I'm curious now, I want to pivot a bit from an individual now to more of an organization perspective. So uh, let's say you were advising a coach or you're advising a team owner, what they could do to reduce stress levels for their players or their coaching staff. Number one, should they even bother with that? Is that something they should even do? Um, or maybe they should keep the stress because people work harder. So should they even bother with this, number one? And number two, what advice do you give them? That was a trick question, Steve. You know that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No, you don't need to worry about it at all, Doc. You know, I know, of course, like that's why we're on this panel. Uh, but again, taking a pragmatic approach, if you think about if you're a, a coach or an owner of an organization and you have your employees, in this case, it's athletes, what are athletes tending to stress out about and there's not infinity things that they're going to stress out about it's academics it's finances it's family it's health you know the big cluster of like the wellness wheel we might have encountered at some point so your first step is acknowledging that your people your athletes might be stressed out about these particular things performances included so one, acknowledging and appreciating, accepting that that's the case. But then the other piece is how do you get resources in place that you can point and triage people to when they're having that particular stress? And so for college athletes, if they're struggling with academics, well, academics tend to work really closely with that athletic organization. And so being a point person, because as a coach, as an owner, you can't solve it all. And so I think the biggest piece is being able to get those resources in place proactively, whether it's mental, whether it's academic, whether it's physical, uh, whether it's financial, et cetera, so that you can point the athletes into those particular directions. And so I think that's a nice practical approach to just get laying the groundwork proactively. Now, Paul, so you've, you've, you've been on these teams and you've worked with a lot of coaches. What do you think about this? Uh, uh, if you were advising a coach or a team owner, what would you recommend about reducing stress for their players or colleagues? Is it important or not? And what, what steps would you recommend they take? So if, even if you're talking with individual or with a group of people, I think I still have the same approach, either that's one individual or a group of people. You know, we're never going to be able to control the outside situation that happens with us. You know, they're just outside situation. But there's always three things that we can do. We can change it, absolutely change it. Ask someone else to help you, you know, to change it. Number two, if you can't change it, walk away from it. If you're lucky enough to have head on your shoulders, arms, legs, you know, will, you can walk away from it. And the third one, can't change it, can't walk away from it, walk away from it, change your mindset towards it. So this is where you shift your mind, 180 degrees. Just looking at a different, a different perspective on it, changing your viewpoint. As simple as it sounds, Honestly, it's the most efficient way. Sometimes it needs to hear it a couple of times, hundreds of times some, for some people, you know, to really understand it. To, and sometimes you do understand it. You, you feel like, oh, yeah, it's as simple as that. But then to really, really like feeling it and living it, you have to practice it, you know, and that comes through daily practice. Whether that be waking up in the morning, moderating yourself and, uh, and going through the words of gratitude for the things that you're just grateful for, even just as simple as breathing, which is the most important part. Without it, we're not able to live. <laughs> and this is why we also start with the breath. We start with the breathing in through the belly. This is where we switch in your parasympathetic nervous system response, the happy Buddha belly. <laughs> even if you have a six pack or an eight pack, <laughs> try to get that big belly. You, you, you'll feel so relaxed so quickly and so fast. And that's when you start to relax and you start to listen. Listen to yourself, first of all, and then listen to other uh, wonderful people who want only the best for you, you know, like Amy, Steve, and Greg. <laughs> That's a little bit of approach of how- And how Paul's. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Well, it, Dr. Amy, I want to give you a crack at this one too. If you're speaking to a, a coach or a team owner, what advice do you give organizationally that they could potentially improve stress levels and stress management within their organization? Well, honestly, the first advice I give is for the coach or the owner to develop their own mindfulness and self-compassion practice, because that will make them more responsive in their conversations with their athlete to challenges that the organization faces as a whole. 
and it can become a common language. And then ideally it's built into the team culture so that if, for example, Steve and Pauls and I are on a team and I'm having what I would call a huge emotional wave, Steve might just say to me like, wow, that was a big wave. And even, even him saying that and saying, you know, Amy, just take a breath or let that go. Then even if I'm not able to do it, my teammate or my coach might be able to remind me. And then the next time I might be able to remind Paul's or Steve. So making these practices, not individual, but a team language, and then you can have teams learn to practice aware, breathe, choose. So I love it because I actually have that practice in my book. And when I present on my own, I have like kids blocks for the ABC, like the little wooden blocks um, that I use as a slide. But, you know, individuals can do aware, breathe, choose, but teams and organizations can do aware, breathe, choose as well. And so the more members of your sports team or your business team or your band that have this skill, the more, um, the more likely it is to be implemented in the moment. So making it a cultural language is really, really helpful. I love that. I love that. Now we only have about a minute left. I just want to give you each 30 seconds, don't think more than that, to say how people listening to this can get in touch with you. I know it's on the chat, but just quickly say how people can get in touch with you if they wanted to follow up. Pauls? Yeah, sure. So all the social media handles, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, is Pauls Project. Uh, oh, with the S and N. <laughs> and, um, and then, and, uh, yeah, also my website, pujats.org. Uh, this is also a website where I, I give my sessions as well, you know, for individuals and for groups and corporations as well. So yeah, thank you everyone for, for listening and, and, and watching. And of course, Dr. thank you. Amy? So thank I'm you. stillquietplace.com and stillquietplace on Twitter. And I actually have a four week fundamentals course coming up starting next Tuesday for anybody who's interested. Great, very good. And Dr. Steve? Yeah, so it looks like Michael just gave a plug in the chat, and this might be a little cringy, but I have uh, an Instagram right here, at my endurance, M-I-N-D-U-R-A-N-C-E. Otherwise, just Google Steve Grafe, and you'll find me. Excellent. You could look for me, Gregory Charlotte, on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way, or also the Women's Sports Forum. And we're actually having an event on the 25th with Miriam from Athlete Soul. So we'd love to have you there. So Miriam, why don't you come on back? Thank you so much, panel. This is excellent. I learned a lot and I'm, I'm glad you could all be here today. And it was fun. Absolutely. Yes. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you guys to, uh, for your participation, your time. I, it's really appreciated. And Greg, thank you for a moderator, as always. I uh, appreciate it. We have a session in 30 minutes, so we're going to all hop off and uh, we'll be coming back for a session on emotional wellness, which we kind of started anyway, uh, but three more panels uh, for the next two hours after that. Thank you all.